And as a reminder, Nexus Reliability includes Fritz Ogden, a senior majoring in chemical engineering from Laramie, Steve Bagley, a financial controller and data scientist for Nexrel, and Chaz Ogden, mechanical engineer and technical developer for Nexrel. And Nexus Reliability is working to revolutionize how heavy industry uses current remote sensing technologies and big data. The Nexus Connect platform not only saves time and money, but also keeps maintainers and operators safe by preventing catastrophic failures before they occur. And so with that, I, the, the format we're using today, NextRail, just so you know, is that our judges will have several questions for you. And one person may ask several questions in a row, and then we'll kind of bounce around to the judges as they have questions. So you can also take turns if you both want to answer, if all three of you want to answer a question or whatever format you want to use to answer the question, feel free since it's a little bit less formal than yesterday. Um, so with that, judges, looking at you to see who wants to start us off this time. Okay, Shay, Shay likes to come out of the out of the gun or <laughs> out of the starting line a little hot. So next row, good luck out there. Shane, we'll hand it over to you. <laughs> Hi, next row. Sorry, I'm 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 a self-proclaimed dummy here. Um sorry about the dingy. So that, that was my fault, Shane. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. So is your expertise the translating or the being the translator? So in my mind, there's all these technologies that are already currently monitoring. Correct. Um, are you basically, are you going after the new technology in those monitoring systems? Or are you going after the processing of that information or both? You're still on mute. Yeah. We still can't hear you, even though it says you're not muted. Is that is that any better? Now there you go. I was muted by better. Yeah. Great. <laughs> sorry about I thought, that. Um, I thought it was just sorry, guys. My quiet. background wasn't working. Working. Uh, <laughs> okay. but, uh, anyway, that's that's a great question, and I'll, I'll start off with uh, saying that yes, sensor technologies are pretty mature, and analytics technologies are pretty mature. Where we step in and really make a difference is in the aggregation, transmission, and translation of the data. Because just because you have ones and zeros, it doesn't mean that you have a, an understanding of what the one and zero means. So do you- So our, our piece is, oh, go ahead. Is this just an idea you have, or do you have some proof of concept or something that says, hey, I can do it? Or yeah, we have so, uh, substantial experience in the field, um, pilots and successful data projects, uh, aggregating data from existing controllers, uh, bringing the data up and storing it in a common platform, which enables everybody to view the data uh, via APIs. You can connect it to different analytics platforms and you can use it um, to make actual decisions. So just, in oh, sorry, Chaz, uh, just to be clear and to kind of add to that, um, our expertise in the past was using uh, previous tech, previously existing technologies to aggregate and store data. And our product is a new way to get that data under one roof and translate it. So our experience is, is, yeah. is doing exactly what we're doing, but our product and our new company is a direction that's tangential from our previous work through identifying a need in the marketplace for exactly what we're trying to do. But you you do have like uh, when you talk beta and maybe Spencer can jump jump in here and rescue me from deep water. Um, you already have proof of concept or proof that you can you can do this. Correct. Your Porter's five uh, forces. Explain that a little more thoroughly because it looks like your two biggest problems are threat of new entrants and threat of substitute products and services. Talk to us a little bit about that. And sure. I'm still looking for rescuing, uh, Spencer. 
Well, my uh, my reasoning behind designing the the Porter's uh, Five Forces analysis like that was just due to the the immaturity of the Internet of Things integration market as it stands currently. So because of the fact that exactly what Chaz was saying, sort of the the inputs and the outputs are sort of well well accounted for in the machine to machine connection world. The fact that there's this very blatantly obvious, albeit difficult to solve gap in the in the middle makes the industry really ripe for competition through new entrants uh, as well as substitute services. So that, that's sort of the, the reasoning behind that, just because it's it's so new. And oh go ahead. Yeah, I'll tail to that and say uh, the business to com consumer um, IoT market is pretty flooded, albeit it's going to grow a lot. But right now, you know, Amazon Alexa, uh, Siri, all that good stuff, th th there's a lot going on. Um, there's room to grow, but the real ripe target is business to business. And the reason why we have such an advance on everyone else is we have figured out how to do it. We've proven that we can do it through field trials and whatnot. And also on top of that, we have the, the size advantage. We're a small nimble organization and the, the heavy lifting, the, the analytics and pattern recognition, you know, GE, for example, has a lot of uh, weigh on us for that. But what they don't have is the ability to match legacy systems, legacy data acquisition systems, SCADA systems, whatever you want to call them, to a common modern um, database, data analytics and processing system. Okay. So uh, you talk it's like Spencer has something to say there. Well, he's still, Spencer, he's still muted. Yeah, Spencer, you're unmuted. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Keep going, Shane. Um, your your IP, help me understand, because obviously the Internet of Things is the wild, wild west, um, in, in my humble opinion. Your uh, two more, maybe it's a question or just pointing out. I'm, I'm curious about the IP that you're trying to corner. And then secondly, right in your direct competitors, I mean, at least you're honest, right out of the gate, Tremble threat when i see the word juggernaut that that isn't you know that's a big deal well established augury well-funded company arundo well-funded company how how are you going to play well all of those competitors work in in very dissimilar market spaces to us so tremble's primary uh, business is in you know, construction, agriculture, GPS positioning, and uh, asset tracking. Sort of like, um, I, I believe it was Spencer mentioned yesterday with geofencing and equipment tracking that way. Uh, and that's not, not specifically focused on where we're going to be starting out, which is stationary equipment. Uh, it basically has no use. And uh, we're focusing on machine reliability technologies. So GPS positioning really doesn't Really doesn't play terribly well in that and augury and arundo mostly play in the um the manufacturing space so think uh plastics plant or a uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing plant something like that where yes they have stationary equipment but no it's not the kind of big loud heavy dirty things that we're talking about working on um, that really could benefit from additional maintenance management technology Okay. And then I'll just, I'll finish up by saying, here's kind of where I'm at with it. Maybe you guys can, I'm sure other questions will maybe chase this to the surface, but it seems like you have a great idea. I don't see, I don't see the path to, it's like, Hey, let's solve world hunger. Great. That sounds awesome. Let's, let's do it. Okay. How, where's the business? I, I, I hear it, but I'm having a, I'm having a difficult time bringing it to the surface of five guys in the basement, so to speak, in Laramie trying to figure this out and monitoring it and, and making it QuickBooks, so to speak, for the fleet operations management uh, systems analysis of the world. I don't know. I'll pass. Well, that's, that's an absolutely fair uh, analysis. And I think you 
you have a, a deep grasp of the problem and just how difficult it is. Um, but that's the exact reason why we're trying to tackle it. Okay. Uh, really, the play is is to find a, a partner, and we do have several leads that that's already well established in the heavy equipment maintenance uh, industry, such as a, a Chevron or an Exxon Mobil, someone like that. And we do have significant headway uh, with a large uh, energy and maintenance company like that uh, that can give us access to large volumes of equipment. Um, and we can supplement their pre-existing offering uh, sort of right on their coattails, so to speak, uh, help them through instrumenting their machinery and provide them with the, the exact service that we're, we're talking about providing. So taking the data that already exists, getting it under one roof, which is absolutely our specialty. Um, the, the, uh, in the presentation on the timeline slide, when I was mentioning the uh, proprietary communications protocol, that is one of the main components to solving this problem, um, transmitting the data and translating it into a single, uh, single data stream and transmitting it is, uh, is, has already been accomplished. So okay, uh, I, another way of saying it, go ahead. You can, if you want to wrap up, you can, and then we'll go to Susan for the next couple of questions. But Chad, you can finish answering that question if you want to. Great, thanks. Another way to say it is our problem is a cookie cutter problem. So every industrial process piece of machinery has similar challenges attached to it. And once you have the communications protocol, the data warehousing on the server side, you know, in the cloud, and the data collection problem solved, which we have, all it is is applying the solution to a given a machine, for example, or a given plant. Uh, large stationary equipment uh, is typically patterned and even mobile equipment has similarities. So if you if you need to care about lubricant quality, if you need to care about vibration, if you need to care about uh, bearing life or grease application or uh, environmental cleanliness, all of those solutions are prepackaged and then can be applied across a, a large fleet very quickly. So there's an element of hardware, there's an element of physicality that's necessary for the process to be complete. So that, that's where our gateway device comes in, but really it's identifying what are the core needs of that operation and then addressing those core needs. And what okay. we've proved out is the, the part that can be patterned across everything. Okay, Susan, let's go to you for your question. Yeah, I'm following up on the question about the pilot and getting that locked in. So my question is, how how close is that to being confirmed um, you know, and the probability that it would happen? Um, well, there's a whole lot of uncertainty due to the, the COVID-19 that I'm sure everyone's experiencing. And our uh, specific partner in this aspect has just recently frozen all of their um, all of their funding for discretionary projects. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a big open-ended um, open ended problem right now. We've had verbal commitments from them um, and we were just moving into the more physical, uh, you know, in writing commitments. And unfortunately, uh, we've just had to put everything on pause. So that's, that's the best answer I can give to that, unfortunately. Okay, yeah, I understand that. It's happening everywhere. Um, uh, then a question just about the, you know, your advisor, what advisory team or group do you have an advisory committee of some sort of outside advisors helping you? Yes, yes, we do have a, a really fantastic group of, of talented uh, and experienced business people that have been helping us um, uh, that, that we've impressed through our past work and also our previous startup competitions that we've competed in. Uh, one, I'm, I believe he might be here with us today, uh, Peter Lapachelle. He's an experienced uh, financial engineer uh, based in Toronto, and he's been really instrumental in helping us develop and build out our professional financial models. Uh, Chris Pullen is a, is a serial entrepreneur and operations specialist that's based in Fort Collins. He's been really helpful throughout this whole process. Uh, Jim Kelly was a mentor that was assigned to us in the uh, Rocky Mountain Clean Tech open um, cohort in 2019 and he's been staying in touch and he's been really great to 
kind of uh, just bounce some general general business operations questions off of and management type things. And uh, we have several more. Okay, to... Good. Okay, other questions from the judges? We're at about halfway just for a little time check. Okay, we'll go Steven and then Walden and then Spencer. Okay, good, thanks. Um, I wanna shift gears just a little bit and take your time with this one. And I, I'm interested in your thought process and techniques for mentioning the medical device application market. I think both in your presentation and your uh, and in your paper, you mentioned that as a uh, possible customer segment. Can you tell me why and what you did to enable you to, to mention that? Sure. And um, the, the real methodology behind that thinking was uh, we had a customer that approached us with a, a specific problem um, uh, regarding the, the ISO standardization of the traceability of all of the uh, components to finished, to finished and shipped products in the medical device industry. And they identified that there is no, there is no real uh, e easy user interface to uh, enable that traceability. And it requires a, a lot of manual labor right now. So in terms of whether it be taking pictures of labels and then, and then printing the labels into PDFs and then putting them in folders or having a, a SharePoint or some other cloud-based storage thing that required manual uh, manual pruning and and curation by an actual human as opposed to a program that you can open and have a barcode scanner and just scan a package and then have it be assigned to where it should be and have the, the appropriate metadata such as uh, the date and where it came from and the inspection uh, in terms of package package quality and making sure it's not all dinged up and things like that automatically propagated through the system so that it, it really enables easy uh, compliance with that, the uh, FDA standards. Okay, thanks. Uh, and uh, to help provide a little bit more detail on that is, is any compliance system is reliant on good quality data. Garbage in is garbage out. And so if data collection can be automated in any way possible, it helps augment and enhance the value of that data for compliance testing, for safety, for FDA um, testing and regulatory needs. So that's the, the large issue that we're trying to address in the medical sector. Okay, well then we'll turn it over to you now. So actually I had a similar question to that because I know early in the slide deck, you talked about connected health as being one of the, the most connected things that you're going after. But then when it came to like analyzing the cash flow and the, the projected revenues, it's not even on the list, right? So why wouldn't one of the top industries that you're focused on be in your cash flow? Well, initially, uh, we're focusing on the heavy industrial sector. That's where the majority of our professional experience lies. And that's where we see the uh, easiest entry. So it's not so much a question of uh, if we're going to do it. Uh, it's just that we're not focusing on it right now. We're trying to be very deliberate about the business leads that we chase down and the growth that we, that we spur in the company right now. And we've decided that it's best for the company to focus almost exclusively on the area where we have the most experience uh, right out of the gate and the most connections and the most uh, ability to make change in the short term. Cool. And then uh, when it comes to like, I know like right now you guys are doing a ton of visualization of the data and like you can send text message alerts and that kind of stuff. but. Like, what's your what's your path to predicted like control? So, like, like if if I'm working in a manufacturing like plant or whatever, and a sensor gets flagged, right? Instead of it getting ran all the way up the flagpole to a human that has to then go shut it down, at which point does your predictable technology roll in where it could just like take control of that device? Um, historically, we've stayed away uh, very deliberately from. Uh, 
on equipment controls just due to, to liability concerns and the difficulty that comes with uh, getting customers to accept that there is a, um, you know, a software or a device in control of their machinery. There's, there's been a lot of pushback from our previous customers and potential, potential customers about that, that idea. So we've sort of been deliberately staying away from that. Uh, and we, we fully anticipate that as our platform matures and as we get uh, a better track record under our belt and, and build the company's name, that's definitely something we're interested in pursuing. Uh, but right now we're, we're very heavily focused on just getting, getting those messages to where they need to be to help the, the operators and the maintainers that already do that uh, for their jobs that information easily and quickly and accurately. Gotcha. And then as far as, um, well, I guess just the impact on Wyoming and kind of looking at how it's going to, how having this business located there in all places, like what do you see as the future for manufacturing in Wyoming compared to, I know right now you're, you're doing a lot of more manufacturing and stationary equipment compared to, you're, you know, you're not, you're not putting this on like I hit on yesterday with like the, the moving vehicles and moving equipment. Right. So like this is on stationary. So what do you see coming down the line manufacturing wise in Wyoming that could benefit from this as a partner? Well, um, first of all, the, uh, I, I would say the actual customer base in Wyoming is secondary to the economic growth that we can bring through our outside business. So just being stationed in Wyoming uh, is a primary primary customer, we're going to be bringing in significant amounts of revenue uh, from all over North America, hopefully, and, and being in Wyoming provides us several uh, excellent tactical advantages. Uh, for instance, we won't be paying income tax on our, our network access device, the, the hardware piece that we're going to be uh, building and storing. And also, we just have excellent access to space for infrastructure when it comes to data warehousing and uh, that sort of thing, and and it's a it's a really nice place to base an operation in North America from because it's relatively equidistant from many different, you know, the east and the west coast, and where lots of different operations are happening. So I can't really speak to to know the future uh, in terms of uh, knowing where manufacturing in Wyoming is going to be going, but I know that we're going to be making a positive impact on the the economy and the community. Um, even if a minority of our customer base is in Wyoming. And last, last quick question, Mandy, sorry. You uh, better be quick because we still got to get a dispenser. So, <laughs> it's something that we haven't actually even talked about even yesterday, but like what service actually uh, are you using to communicate the data from the actual machine to the cloud? So are you using like a, are you using a cell phone base, like with a SIM card or are you using um, like a CAN system or you, like what, like what communication are you using? So it's primarily 4G LTE based cellular communication. Um, we have experience and we have uh, provisions that we're going to bake into our communications protocol to use satellite uh, if the, the situation warrants it uh, as, an, as an upcharge. Um, but the, the network access device is our own piece of uh, electronics that houses a, a SIM card from a generic provider that allows us to transmit data over, over satellite or cellular. And so our protocol, oh, go ahead, sorry. Our protocol is what I would say is portable, meaning that it can be ported to any device. We have dr drivers that can be installed on any end device that supports it, obviously one that can connect to the internet, either cellular or satellite. And from there, the data transmission is agnostic to the device. It gets to our servers and it's processed. Cool. Thank you. Okay, Spencer, we'll turn it over to you. We only have about three minutes left. So sorry to give you a short window. All right. Uh, my first question, this is something we deal with a lot. Have you heard of NERC and FERC, those organizations? Yes. Yeah, FERC, for everybody, it stands for like Federal Energy Reliability Commission or something along those lines. <clears throat> We're governed by them for cybersecurity. So we have a variety of firewalls so that um, a third party can't hack into our control system and ruin our facility. How, what are your guys' plans to fit into these firewalls? 
We have a two pronged approach to that exact problem. The, the first prong is to use, um, I call it outside the walled garden communications. So data we collect is outside your SCADA system and unattached to your controls. So our sensors, our data feeds can't really feed back to you. They don't affect controls. They just affect decision-making for you. So again, back to Fritz's presentation, the data is useful for you to make a, a small action and uh, achieve a large savings from that small action, but it's not useful to shut down a plant, to change power routing, to control anything. The other way we can go is we have um, a NERC and FERC uh, uh, compliant gateway partner. We can actually add a, a security device called a data diode in line, which air gaps us from the internet. So you still get data out, but there's no possible connection for someone to make a, a malicious action in, into your system. I'm very familiar with the data diodes. They're extremely expensive. Uh, yes, and so we, we typically try to go for the, the outside the wall garden approach versus the data diode approach. Good answer. Okay, now I just want to try to understand your product. Um, so for example, the plant I work at, we have a lot of continuous data coming in either on like Modbus over ethernet, mm -hmm. Um, so that's stuff like on our, on our Bentley racks where we're constantly monitoring vibration. Um, but then we also have some data that's only periodically measured by a human, for example, vibration routes on a CSI or lube reports, which are input into an access database. So mm -hmm. what you're saying your product can do is I can take my OPC, my Modbus, my access database, and my app, uh, asset machinery management si system all that data can come into your system and then that your server your database is the gathering of all that data that then yeah. products such as predix or other advanced pattern recognition can access easily to put into their models is that yeah, a good correct idea? correct and we go one step further so all of that stuff is the case but we also integrate um tuned you know uh, best use case best practice real-time sensing to say help augment the, the lube monitoring, help augment the vibration, help augment, you know, bearing temperatures, et cetera. So we, we don't make the sensors, but we figure out, all right, you have some big motors, you have a transformer, what do you care about? Maybe you care about water and oil transformer. So, so we, you can get into the analytics then, it's not simply a data thing. Correct. So yeah, I think so, that, that's my concern, is if you get into the analytics, you have massive competition. Yes. You yeah. have competition developed with hundreds of millions of dollars everywhere. If you simply stay at the data collection and normalizing into a nice, easy database, I do think there is some potential. We already struggle with this, manually putting things in. You know, we bring all our stuff into Pi that then Predix can answer. Yeah. And then, you, then we've got a guy manually entering things into an access report, similar to what we were talk to, talking about earlier. So I, I, I guess my advice would be to try to narrow your focus onto your um, your proprietary product because there's too much analytics out there. There's a ton of reliability engineers out there, a lot of which are gonna be looking for jobs soon. And so I, I just, that would be my recommendation. Yeah, and to clarify, I think I misunderstood your point a second ago. Uh, we don't focus on the analytics as much as the data collection and we help automate as much data collection as possible. So and like you would I, go recommend say if, I'm building a new plant and trying to figure out what I want to put uh, to monitor my turbine vibrations, you would recommend, oh, Bentley, Nevada, or Emerson, Correct. like that. Correct, yep. And but we would also would say- you, Would you then subcontract that, or you would just be a recommendation to say, hey, this would work well with my box, my little data converter? It depends on the arrangement you, you get, but yes, we would, we would subcontract that potentially. And also we would go into an old plant and help figure out how to automate data collection in the old plant, which is, quite possibly the, the more substantial impact we could have. Okay, I think I have to cut, cut us off. Sorry, Spencer, great questions. Most of them went well over my head. Uh, Shane, do you, want, do you want one more question? One more. You got it. So this is a quick answer. You guys got to, uh, you're partly graded on the quickness of it too. So decide and go. If there was a uh, gold, silver and bronze package of money Obviously, gold, you'd like a million bucks. Uh, but if you can try and bronze, maybe a little bit of cheese, you know, two grand because we need to do X. Talk to us real quick about gold, silver, bronze, 
uh, award winnings, if you would? Uh, I would say gold would be $20,000. Um, I think that's a fair, fair, uh, you know, sort of first prize. Uh, silver would be, sorry, what, Steve? Go ahead. You're still up. Oh, okay. Uh, silver would be uh, $10,000, I would say. Uh, I think that's it's also a fair chunk of the pie uh, when it comes to the, the remaining teams. And bronze would be uh, $5,000, I suppose, to keep in that sort of uh, cutting it in half theme. So does that fit? I mean, how does it fit with your organization, what you're trying to accomplish more than what you think's fair? What, how does, what kind of minimum, God, it'd be nice to get this money, it'd be nice to get this money, and then who? Hmm. That's your final answer, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Mandy, yours. You're good. No, I'm glad you got that in. And thank you all. I know it's really technical, so it's hard to answer questions uh, to non-technical judges and all of us kind of trying to dive in and understand it. So thank you for your patience and for explaining each of those pieces. Uh, round of applause to you all. Thank you for joining us. Great.